ready for boarding? Yes, good. So my name is Mina and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Flight Radar. Seven years ago, I was standing here at the same stage, having swimming goggles on my head, and I was talking about swimming in the blue ocean. But in fact, I didn't talk about swimming. Uh, metaphorically, blue ocean is a synonym for a new market niche, for a new market opportunity. At that time, I worked in a fintech and uh, gaming industries, and I was trying to find uh, new opportunities on the market for those industries. But two years ago, I have started soaring through the blue skies. Why? In order to understand my decision, let's go back in time, more than 70 years ago. 70 years ago, there was one small boy born in Stockholm, lived in Gamla Stan. He was very creative, innovative. When he was 12 years old, he constructed himself soapbox car, load bill, engine driven. Even Dagens Industry write an article about that boy. But then he got obsessed with the blue oceans. When he was 18 years old, he constructed himself a real submarine, Dopningen, which could go on the 90 meters depth. After being fascinated by blue oceans, he did a lot of other great inventions that we are using nowadays. He invented computer mouse, he invented color graphics, ferry graphique for computers. Maybe some of you can guess his name. Yes, it is Håkan Lanz, one of the greatest Swedish inventors all time. But after doing all those great inventions, he moved from blue oceans to the blue skies. You see the parallel from blue oceans to the blue skies? I'm not uh, saying any comparisons, just uh, mentioning that. And he had one big dream. He was thinking about the pilots who couldn't see each other when they're in the cockpit. So his big dream was to get one big holistic dashboard about everything that is happening in the air space. So that each pilot can see where he is in the air space, but also to see all other people uh, and planes in the uh, air space. At that time, it wasn't possible. We are talking about 70s. But what was the problem? Let's go back and see how it works with the traditional uh, air control. You have an ATC rather, and uh, you have an aircraft. And the ATC is responsible to interrogate and ask questions about that plane. Plane sends a position from their navigation system that wasn't so precise. Also, it was uh, centralized because you need the ATC to send those uh, requests and responses. And also, at that time, it was a lot of an interference of the signals, so it was also loss for the business because they couldn't uh, let many planes uh, flying next to each other. Thanks to GPS positioning system that was developed during the 80s, and some great minds as Håkan Lanz and other people who contributed to that, today we have something that is called ADS-B signals. So Håkan Lanz's old dream came through. Each aircraft or flying object in general is emitting a certain signal that is emitted on a certain frequency. They're, and they are saying to everyone, it's a broadcast message, hello, I'm here to other aircrafts, to the air, uh, uh, ground control, but also to the satellites that amplifies the signal. So now I need a co-pilot assistant to help me with uh, these uh, gadgets. 
Let's see what is the aviation data, in fact. When we are talking about aviation data, we are talking about those ADSB messages. So it's in a hex format, and it's emitted on a certain frequency, 1,090 megahertz. It contains GPS position, of course, because it's GPS-based, unique flight identifier called call sign, unique aircraft identifier, some fly other flight info, and also weather info, because weather is very relevant and important for pilots, right? All aircrafts, everything that is flying on a certain altitude must emit this signal. It's a worldwide convention. All types, passenger flights, helicopters, private jets, military planes, balloons, even bigger drones, everyone has a hardware device called the ADSB transponder attached to that uh, flying object, aircraft, and is emitting that ADSB signal. As I mentioned, I worked in the gaming industry, I worked in the fintech industry. When I joined the aviation industry, I could notice directly two beauties with working with the aviation data. The first beauty is data format. It's not changing very often. Every 10 years, compared to the gaming industry, when you have those big market leaders, Microsoft, so Sony, changing telemetry format like every month and you need just to catch up with the changes, here you can just relax and don't have to think so much about the data format changes. Also, the safety is one of the most important things in aviation. So that's why ADSB signal is a public signal worldwide. You don't have to have any compliance or legal department. It's just to collect. But is it really so easy to collect it? Let's see. In order to be able to collect that, you need to have a corresponding hardware device. Since aircraft has an ADSB transponder, you need to have an ADSB receiver. You can develop that by printing your own circuit board, as we do at FlightRadar, or use a Raspberry Pi. Also, you need to have a worldwide coverage, right, to capture all those signals about all the flights. By engaging community and all aviation geeks, we managed to have uh, 40,000 receivers worldwide and worldwide coverage. So, how the acquisition of data goes? Is it just to listen to that certain frequency? It's a little bit more complicated. So, we have our receivers and they capture easily all those ADSB signals. But you have a plenty of aircraft that are still using those more uh, old-fashioned methodology with the integration mode S. Also, what happened? You know, it's a radio signal. Many different things can happen with them. Also, in US, they're using another format, UIT, for the smaller planes, and it's emitted on another frequency. As a radio signal, it can happen interference, interference between the signals. Also, it can ha ha happen spoofing, that someone is injecting some wrong data. You need to polish and decide which data are correct, which are not, right? And also, for those uh, signals that are non-positional, that does not contain GPS position, we are applying a very advanced multilateration algorithm, counting that time difference of arrival in order to decide the position of the certain aircraft. So, let's continue. Is it enough just to collect all those positional and non-positional data and create such a dashboard? No, it's not enough. What happens if the aircraft is flying over the blue ocean? We don't have any ground for our receivers. Then we need to combine with the data that we are getting from satellites, different type. Also, positional data are telling us just about the current position of the aircraft, but not where it started, where it is going to go. So we need to enrich the data with a lot of information. Schedules, routes, destination, flight plans. 
and we are getting them from many different sources, airlines, Eurocontrol, UIG. So it's a very complex data acquisition, gathering data from many different sources. And then we process that data. And the things are diff uh, difficult because some standards are not the same around the world, and it is about real-time data. But when we manage to process them and process and decide one source of truth, then we are able to create the following dashboard from Holcom Lans Dream. And furthermore, because we enriched those positional data, when you click on each aircraft, you get a lot of detailed information about that uh, aircraft and flight and many, many interesting information. Also, we need to do some advanced data processing. As I said, everything is just a public signals. No one is notifying us, oh, you know, this plane is going to take off, this plane is going to land. We need to calculate all those events and time estimations just from the positions, real-time positions, changes in altitude, how the aircraft has turned, or when it is supposed to land. So it's a very advanced calculation. And as I said, safety first. So it's very important with our data, data consistency, data accuracy, and data trustworthiness. We have a 4 million daily users. We track 250,000 uh, flights per day, which results in 70 million flights per annually. But uh, did we create this dashboard just because of Hawken Lance dream? Is there anyone else who get the value from these dashboards? Yes, we are both in B2C and B2B business. B2C, you have a private customers. Many people like you are using to follow your flights to get the latest information if there are any delays, disruptions on the airports when your family members or friends are flying. I used to say it's also anti-stress application because now you see the plane has landed. So if your child teenager forgot to send you an SMS, mom, I have landed, you can safely see that at the flight radar app. Also pilots, why do they use our app? Because we are the only one who are giving to them the holistic picture about everything that is happening in the airspace from their airlines they're receiving just information about the flights from their airline, but not another. And it's very valuable for them because they can on time plan landing, taking offs and different things. So they really appreciate that we exist. And even for a pilot training, there are a lot of usage of our website and application. Then we have a lot of aviation geeks who like to follow all those ground speed, speed in the air and other parameters. And we have a plane spotters, people who love to just uh, observe the planes in the air. For them, we develop one very interesting feature that is called augmented reality. So when you activate that feature, if you see the plane in the sky, you just take your mobile, turn to that direction, and on the screen, you will get information about all planes in that part on the sky. They love that. Furthermore, this feature saved many lives. How? Imagine a non-developed country where signaling for evacuation is not working well. Imagine people who are living on the countryside next to the forest with a big risk for a fire in the forest. When fire happens, state sends uh, firefighting aircrafts, but they, they don't signal to people that it's time to evacuate. They are using this feature, and that when they identify that is firefighting uh, plane in the sky, they know it's time to evacuate. So this feature saved many lives. In the B2B business, all aviation-related companies, airlines, airports, aircraft manufacturers are using our data, even broader. Also taxi companies in order to optimize their logistics. 
If you remember from the beginning, ADSB message contains the basic information about the weather and the aircraft speed. So you can calculate also wind speed, temperature, pressure. Many weathercast companies are using our data to do weather forecast because they're not having the weather stations in some faraway places where we have our receivers, like on Greenland. Also, non-profit organizations are using our data in order to predict those natural disasters, fires, flooding, and etc., due to those uh, weather information. And also, financial and business experts are also using our data. If they analyze which type of military planes are using in the certain occasions, they can predict world economy. So you see, working with aviation data and aviation is beautiful. It's much wider than just aviation industry. And now, so if we focus more on this top of the pyramid, data science, AI, machine learning. I'm sure that we are going to discover many new areas where avi aviation data are going to be uh, valuable for the humankind. So now I'm going to be able to answer your question why I moved from blue oceans to the blue skies. In fact, I haven't stopped swimming in the blue oceans. There is a secret connection between them. And please listen carefully. Blue skies are the new blue oceans of the data. It's a new possibilities, unexplored possibilities of aviation data. And those unexplored possibilities will create value both for business, but also for humankind. Thanks for listening. <laughs>